All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the Workforce and Community Engagement in Inland Southern California webinar. This is the fifth of a six-part warehousing and logistics seminar series put on by the Inland Center for Sustainable Development. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, ICSD is a research center that's housed within the UC Riverside School of Public Policy. Um, they strive to coordinate inter-industry sustainability efforts, to promote collaboration among key stakeholders, and to conduct their own rigorous, uh, locally relevant research that supports our region's sustainable future. Um, so we're delighted for you to join us today uh, for this really important and continuing conversation. My name is Justine Ross, and I am the Associate Director of the Presley Center. Given today's focus on community, I'll, I'll just explain by saying the Presley Center is sort of a, just another research center within the broader UCR School of Public Policy community. Um, so I'm really happy to be part of today's event, which has been made possible by the efforts of the ICSD team, including Internal Director and Professor of Public Policy, Dr. Ching Feng Wong, Research Manager, Kristen Kopko, Deputy Director and Professor of Political Science, Dr. Ron Leverage, and External Director, Rick Bishop. As well, um, we have to thank the School of Public Policy's external engagement team and student ambassadors for their support of this event beforehand, during and after. They are doing all of the technical work to make sure that things come off smoothly and, and seamlessly, and we're incredibly grateful for the support that they provide and, and making sure that this is a good experience for everybody. So before I introduce our guests, I just want to take care of a couple of little bits of housekeeping. Um, first, I said this is the fifth in a six-part series. The final installment is entitled The Impact of Warehousing and Logistics Industry on Regional Planning, Financial Incentives, and Local Public Policy. Um, and it is on Wednesday, March 6th at 4 p.m., so in about a month. Um, the topic, as, as the title suggests, inherently lends itself to sort of a synthesis and greater exploration of all of the topics, topics that will have been covered so far. So we really encourage you to attend. I think it's going to be a really nice end cap to this series. Um, and you can register by uh, visiting ICSD's website, which is icsd.ucr.edu. Or you can click it on the link that I'm about to drop into the chat. It'll redirect you directly to the registration page and you can make sure you don't miss out that way. Uh, so second bit of housekeeping, if you've been here before, you know that we welcome attendees questions and encourage you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, not the chat function, the Q&A, um, to submit your questions and comments as they come to you over the next hour. If we aren't able to get to your question for some reason, we do provide them to the panelists after the event. We give them a chance to reflect on your, your thoughts, your questions, author a response, and then we push those back out to you. So if we don't get to your question in the next hour, uh, we will get to it in, in the next week or so. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, this is all about bringing together community and sharing information. And so we do wanna make sure that your questions are answered. Um, so go ahead and, and drop them as they occur to you. Um, so this event series was born of ICSD's initial research on manufacturing and logistics in the Inland Empire, um, and a desire to really just better, better understand that dynamic. Um, so we're really excited today to be joined by a fantastic and diverse panel um, who could further shed some light, especially as relates to workforce and community. Um, so it is my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, our panelists. Joining us is Assembly Majority Leader, um, Emerita Eloise Gomez Reyes, representing California's 50th Assembly District. Thank you and welcome. Uh, Paul Granillo, President and CEO of the Inland Economic Partnership. Hi there, good afternoon. Dr. Michael McCarthy, Vice Chair of Riverside Neighbors Opposing Warehouses. This is fantastic, everyone's fading in. Thanks so much for joining us, Mike. And then finally, uh, Dr. Rosabel Ochoa, Associate Vice Chancellor of Technology Partnerships here at UC Riverside. So we thank all of you, terrific. Hi, Rosabel. Um, so we thank all of you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, the format is going to be very similar to prior events. I'm just going to pose uh, a question to all of you. So please feel free to jump in, to reply to somebody else's response. 
Um, we really sort of want this to be more of a dialogue. So I'm going to do my best to kind of fade into the background and just pose the next question as, as time requires. So we're looking forward to your insight and perspective. And if there aren't any questions, we'll jump, we'll jump right in. So with that, um, first, we'd like for you to kind of consider and discuss the most important impacts of the concentration of the warehousing and logistics industry on civic workforce and or community uh, engagement in our region. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about if your organization or if you personally have been involved in the decision-making process, and if so, sort of what your experience is engaging with local communities. Who would like to kick us off? All right, I think I'll start. I'm looking at Paul and Paul hasn't said anything. So Paul, I'm gonna begin then. As uh, you should, as you should. So I, the, I think the first part is the civic and community engagement. When we're talking about logistics and warehouses, I, I think that this has been an issue that has really rallied a lot of the people in the community uh, into being more involved on the issue, especially those who are most impacted. Um, I. I I will tell you that I'm very proud of the grassroots efforts that have come from the community regarding this. Um, and community isn't just people who live next to warehouses, but also parents, uh, the children um, who's, who have, whose kids are going to schools and are, are impacted. Our small business owners have also been impacted. They're involved. And many activists um, have been more involved. And they're, they're going to city council meetings and county board of supervisors meetings, school boards, planning commissions, and other local government meetings. I think this is really important. Um, any decision that is made regarding any aspect of society should engage as many people as possible. Now, on the workforce, I, I would say that the impact is a little split. For, for those who are building the warehouses, uh, it's something that is very good. Um, the, the, we have many union jobs um, and the jobs are being kept close to home. So many of the, the those who work in the industry are very happy to see more and more of the logistics and warehouses being built. But then we have those who work inside the warehouses and by and large, many of them are low wage um, there are other issues regarding the inside of the, of the warehouse. Um, so it isn't, it isn't the same. And, and when we also talk about the workforce, we also are talking about those who are the teachers uh, in the schools that are next to the warehouses. They are being impacted. But the work for, workforce itself, even they are pretty, pretty split. Uh, on the economic um, aspect of this, um, I think that it's so important, and, and every time I talk about this, I talk about how important it is to balance uh, the, the issues that are involved and trying to find the, the best balance between building more warehouses and the jobs that they provide, uh, the economic um, development that is provided from that, and looking at people's health, uh, their ability to find housing, because some of these areas where we have the warehouses are areas that used to be zoned for resident, re, zoned residential. Um, the issue of air quality, degradation of the roads and uh, goes on and on. But I think finding, finding that balance is probably for me the most important part of it. We also have to look at the finding the diversity in our, uh, our economy. Uh, if, if, if warehouse jobs or the warehouse and logistics industry is providing all of these jobs. What's going to happen when we move to automation? Um, it, it's something we have to consider as the, the vacancy rate increases. How What are we doing to think about what we're going to do with those big boxes, those big warehouses? How are we going to repurpose them? That's something that we have to consider. Uh, th this diverse portfolio for our communities has to be considered. Um, now, my involvement as a legislator, uh, I've introduced a number of pieces of legislation trying to create those guardrails for the siting uh, and placement of warehouses 
to protect the community pr pr principally. That's pr my primary concern here. Um, and we'll talk about that in the next question. So I, I appreciate uh, um, the perspective of uh, my, my good friend, um, the assembly member, uh, Gomez Reyes. I, I wanna probably paint a little bit bigger picture of the community though, because I think we're all a part of the community. Uh, that's, and when I say all of us, I say it's all of us who are participating in the goods movement economy. So everybody watching this, just take a look around uh, your room and everything that is there, everything you're wearing, everything you're sitting on, um, got there due to this system of systems, which is the goods movement system, which includes trucks and warehouses. And it's um, a pretty good guess that um, of the 60 people that I see participating in the, in the webinar, uh, somebody's going to buy something from Amazon during this time, right? And that's a part of our reality too. That's how we have chosen uh, to move away from brick and mortar and chosen uh, to purchase goods. And so we need to appreciate that that is the, a part of the community that is uh, driving what we see in the Inland Empire. And then to the community of the Inland Empire, um, we should uh, be proud to be the 12th largest metropolitan statistical area in the United States out of 390. We're bigger than San Francisco and we're close to passing Boston, Cambridge. So we're a big place of 4.7 million people. Very diverse, right? Uh, half of our population is Latino, fifth largest Latino population in the United States. That's part of our community. Also part of our community is the reality that 21% of our 4.6 million people have a baccalaureate degree, okay? And that means we don't participate in the tech economy. And we have to look to jobs that um, have a lower entry point uh, for those people that don't have that baccalaureate uh, degree. And so logistics has been uh, uh, in alignment uh, for the really, uh, large, the largest percentage of our population that doesn't have a baccalaureate degree. And these jobs in logistics right now are paying between uh, 22 and $25 an hour. So that's more than retail, right? That's more than food service. So we have to appreciate that uh, that's the entry point and that um, if you work hard, uh, you can be very successful in this industry. And the community that makes up the, the people that work in this industry, that diverse community, make, is about 400,000 people in our region that participate in goods movement, in, uh, in uh, warehousing, uh, as the assembly member says, in construction. Um, and we also have to look at trucking. And we need to remember that part of the reason that we are such a, a worldwide hub for uh, logistics is that we are connected to the ports of LA and Long Beach. And so I, you know, my hope is that as we tackle these issues that we realize that we are on the cusp of uh, hopefully a near zero emissions uh, uh, world. And in the Inland Empire, once upon a time, there was a huge citrus industry. As a matter of fact, uh, those of you at UCR, you're known for your study of the citrus industry that no longer exists in the Inland Empire, right? Um, but what does exist is a very important uh, economic driver for the United States, the state of California and the world. And I think we need to be doing the best research that we can uh, to make it as clean as possible because no matter what we think, um, this need for us to have goods, the ones that surround us, the ones that are going to feed us later, um, it's not going to go away. And so we need to um, build a system that is sustainable, uh, that allows people to continue to have, uh, enjoy employment, enjoy health insurance, um, and to make sure that it's as clean as, as possible. Um, and that future is also going to very soon uh, also uh, include drone delivery, ground drone delivery and air drone delivery, which is something else we need to discuss, but I'll stop there.
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike McCarthy, and um, I'm just a resident. I am not a decision maker. I have not been involved in actually getting any policies passed or blocking any warehouses or doing anything else. Um, I moved to Riverside in 2014, so I'm also a transplant, uh, like many uh, folks in the Inland Empire. And uh, my organization, Riverside Neighborhood Opposing Neighbor, uh, Riverside Neighbors Opposing Warehouses, uh, we're opposing a specific project. It's a warehouse complex sandwiched between three neighborhoods. Uh, it's about 4.7 million square feet of warehouses, and we've been opposing it for two years. And uh, even though I'm a city of Riverside resident, it's the adjacent jurisdiction, which is a joint powers authority, which is the March Joint Powers Authority, which is a Air Force Base Redevelopment Agency. They have authority over it. The city of Riverside has a good neighbor guidelines policy that says how close warehouses can be, but the March Joint Powers Authority doesn't. And so they get to build things according to their standards and not my standards that I in the city that I live in. And even though I have representatives on that joint powers agency, it's a second hand agency is like, I don't, we're not their direct constituents. So in terms of the civic engagement part, our community has been advocating with our city, with the other cities that are part of the joint powers authority, the county, with our state legislators. I've met um, assembly member Reyes before and, and thank you for advocating for us. I've met with my congressman, uh, I've met with the state senator, um, and all of these uh, politicians are very happy to talk with us about it, and then nothing happens. Um, so when we talk about civic engagement, there's this concept of meaningful involvement, where people's voices can change the outcomes of policy decisions, and that's what's lacking. Uh, as a community member, I can scream until I'm blue in the face, but that's not going to do anything until we sue. And so that is the thing that is resulting in policy change. That is a thing that's resulting in good neighbor guidelines. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later. But when we talk about engagement, when we talk about like uh, who's involved in making decisions at the March Joint Powers Authority, there's a structural and deliberate omission of engagement. We asked for a community advisory board. They rejected it. Okay, they didn't want us to be a part of their decision-making process. When we talk to the city of Riverside, they've talked about strengthening their good neighbor guidelines, but they're holding it off because there's elections coming up and they don't want to have any you know, contentious decisions right now. When we talk to the air quality district, they're getting uh, federal highway funding pulled potentially because we're not going to meet the air quality standards in time. And you know, they then quote that it's a thriving goods movement industry, even though that's the industry that's causing our air quality problems. And then we talk about SCAG, which is the regional transportation agency that puts all the trucks in the road. Uh, we wrote a region in crisis letter report saying how these warehouses are affecting our region. And it wasn't even acknowledged because goods movement is too important. It's exempt from any sort of compact or smart development, the policies that are, are applied to residential and commercial developments. And so when I look at community engagement, I see that the community's voices, at least certain parts of the community's voices are not heard. We are sort of deliberately undersold. And I think that's just because the nonprofit sector and the public interest sector in the Inland Empire is underfunded and doesn't have the same sort of voice and participation um, and um, you know, structural uh, power that they do in the coastal counties like LA and, or Orange County, where these warehouses are not being built, which is the key thing, because those ports are closer to them, but they're being built out here. So that's all I'll say about that for now. And uh, thank you. So, Justin, I don't know if you want me to share some of my slides here or maybe later. Whatever your preference is. So maybe I'll add. I like to share from the perspective of the university some of the work that we have been doing that, in a way, are aimed at addressing some of the issues that you are um, referring, particularly around economic development, economy diversification, workforce training, providing opportunities for the general, the community, not just the people that are in the STEM fields, but also in the community at large, and how we can leverage the, the research, the talent, and the advanced infrastructure that the university has to really bring understanding to some of these very important issues that are being discussed, but also trying to offer, um, I would say, possibilities or options, right, uh, uh, for our community. So, I'm going to take the liberty to go very quickly to a few slides 
just to bring you, because this is a, a new audience. Uh, of course, I know Paul um, for, since I started here at UCR, but um, just to give you some um, very quickly an overview of the work that we've been doing uh, here at the university. So, um, let's put it this, and I'm going to, so just real quick, my, my title is Associate Vice Chancellor, and I really oversee a group of, uh, that is focused on three, four major areas, intellectual property, that means accelerating the transfer of innovation and, and, and technology that is created in the university and transfer it to the private sector, to the startup, to entrepreneurs, so they can build companies and create jobs, particularly in the region. Also building opportunities for the private sector to work with the university, hire our students, um, even hire technical experts, so they can build competency, become more competitive in the marketplace. And also some activities around innovation, entrepreneurship, support of the creation of innovative businesses that scale and also that they can create jobs, that they can help diversify their economy as well as um, uh, or, the, or their activities around economic development that I'll share with you very quickly. So Paul mentioned about the long tradition that our region has regarding agriculture and that, uh, that tradition of research excellence remains at UC Riverside. You probably have eaten the, the cuties mandarin or the, the halo. Those were, that mandarin was developed here in Riverside at the UCR and is now sold over 30 countries around the world. And this summer, a new variety of avocado called Luna was released commercially. And now it was named one of the top 200 inventions by Time Magazine. So that, um, that tradition of research excellence in agriculture, in engineering, many other fields uh, continue. The university is about, generates around $300 million a year of research. We have about 25,000 students and it has a very highly ranked programs in engineering, in science, and in humanities. Um, just to give you an example, uh, and that those inventions, my office transfers those, and they are commercialized. Another example, professor created a new material based on what they ob he observed uh, in a mantis shrimp. Uh, this is a shrimp that is in the, in the ocean. And then they, they can actually imitate how the structure is created and they create a new coating material that now is built, we, we launch a company around it called Helicot. And that Helicot industry here in the Inland Empire is producing products for the hockey industry. So that's the type of role that universities like ours and like mine um, offers. Uh, we also are very much focused on not only um, transfer, but also building companies around. And we have a complete in integrated infrastructure from uh, to help innovators and entrepreneurs and, uh, and inventors, not only from the university, but also from the community, explore what it takes to build companies around it. We provide education, we provide um, a, a sources of funding, um, and also access to resources so they can build prototypes and then we help them transfer and build companies around uh, those ideas or those technologies that can turn into a company and then we incubate those companies and that everything is access to attached to a mentor. So all of these programs are all entering into a program that is we call it EPIC and the heart of the EPIC is the mentor. And these are entrepreneurs that really work with our uh, innovators through the process from the moment that they have an idea. Why does this matter? So back in 2017, when we plotted all the startup companies, science-based or technology-based companies in the Southern California, in the Inland Empire, we found very few innovative startups being created. Seven years later, after all this infrastructure that we had put in, we have worked with over 600 ventures Many and, and the majority are in the inland California. So this uh, the, and these companies are in across multiple sectors: uh, life sciences, technology, semiconductors, agriculture, and and um, biotech and others. And uh, in fact, uh, this past year, this company we we have helped these companies raise over six eighty million dollars in private capital. The issue that we face in that region 
is that more than 90% of that capital is not here. We have to go to the coast to raise these funds. That is a big challenge. So now we have lots of creative uses, lots of creative ideas, but if the capital in that investment is not here, these companies, they are formed, but then they leave. We need to we figure a way not, not only to birth them, but also keep them here. So this is an example of one of these great companies that we're coming out. This is um, coming from the School of Medicine and the School of Business. And, and they are creating technology that is being used, uh, in, for example, in the sports industry and the raising capital um, in um, outside of our region. So what we decided to do is that we're going to, we talk about sustainability, we're talking about the issue about warehouses, air quality, but also the transition to net zero, the electrification of the industry, the long tradition of the, of the uh, around um, a region, around agriculture, what resources. So we created an initiative called OASIS. And OASIS has three pillars, sustainability, innovation, and social inclusion. So just to give you some example of what we are trying to do, to uh, to, to really uh, try to diversify the economy, try to create a uh, job opportunities for our for our, 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 our community, is that we created a series of programmatic and physical elements that are designed to actually provide opportunities for workforce training, for incubation, and for companies to be cre to be um, to grow here in the region. One of them is called the Oasis Park. I'll show you in a second what it is. The other one is the called the Northside Ag Innovation Center with, this, with the city of Riverside, which is a state-of-the-art innovation, eight acres of land that are going to be a place where we can actually explore climate smart agriculture technology and incubate companies around the area. We're talking about the Salton Sea and lithium and the, and the electrification. We're working also on the creation of a certification lab and training facility, not necessarily for PhDs. So they can actually um, su support the future lithium industry, but at the same time being trained on how to uh, do quality control and characterization of this material. And with uh, and with, uh, with um, um, Paul and other uh, members of our community, we are exploring the creation of a center of excellence in logistics, focus on that transition of of supporting the industry on that transition to electrification. From the programmatic side, we have a number of programs over 14 that are focused all on supporting the transition, uh, supporting sustainable businesses. This is the Center for Sustainable Development. So how do we create and support sustainable businesses in areas around agriculture, transportation, energy storage, health disparities, so they can grow in our region. So the, the park is going to be located across campus on University Avenue around a block from, uh, from the California Air Resources Board. It's going to be uh, built and in, 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 uh, be operational in 2026 in the summer of this year. Um, it has three elements. It has research laboratories, state of the art, uh, uh, for uh, um, 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 atmospheric and air quality research. You mentioned the, the impact of the the, sustain, the the transportation and logistics industry in air quality, where so CSER is really is, um, um, focused on, on that in environmental research, incubation space, and training facilities. Um, so I'm going to skip that. These are all the programs that are part of that whole com continuum of, of um, uh, support uh, that we try to uh, offer to companies and entrepreneurs for our region. And we're talking about workforce. We have workforce uh, training for high schoolers on the future of agriculture, on, on the future of transportation. And these are some of the, 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 the workshops that we do. And we're going to do this again in, in the April of this year. We also have a program called the Zero to Entrepreneur in Six Months, in which People that do not, these are aimed at the community, people that do not have a STEM degrees, can be high schoolers, can be recent graduates, that they can actually be exposed to the elements of what it takes to build an agricultural technology or a sustainable transportation business here in the Inland Empire. And this is delivered by our faculty. 
and, and, and online and also in person. Uh, and that leads to how do we can give you act and act, how these companies, once they form, they can access capital. So we finished the first round of the certificate this past year, 150 people participated. And we actually, uh, with funding from the uh, Irvine Foundation, we were able to, grant, to, to do a pitch competition in which six finalists from our region competed for $110,000. But then where is going to be the next funding coming? And then finally, we have uh, programs around uh, uh, battery uh, ecosystem development and sustainable transportation. And in this case, we, uh, as we were looking at the National Science Foundation regional innovation engines, and we actually conducted over 50 interviews to, with the industry and asked them, what will it take for you to transition and meet the goals of the state with respect to net zero and we received ex excellent feedback. And based on all that excellent feedback and recommendations, we were able to actually put together a program that we would like to be integrated into what we call the future for the Center of Sustainable Logistics. So I just wanted to very quickly share with you what we are trying to do rather to, to bring solutions rather than you know, just try to see, uh, because this is a very difficult and, and challenging um, situation, let's say. Thank you. No, and, and it's really interesting. And I'm sure the attendees agree to hear sort of your different perspectives on different facets of the community. Um, I do really quickly before we get to the next question, just want to remind those in attendance, please continue to submit your questions. I do see them here. We're going to actually get to, I think, a few of them in, in the course of our next questions. So um, just continue to submit and uh, I'll, I'll keep checking. Um, but with that, Assembly Majority Leader, Leader Emerita uh, really set us up, I think, for this next question. Um, so we want to ask you all, in recent years, there have been numerous pieces of legislation um, and policy that impact the warehousing industry that have been either proposed or passed. So we're talking AB 1000, which was introduced in 2023 um, and will be reconsidered in 2024, and the City of Riverside's Good Neighbor Policy in 2020, um, among many others. Um, but we want to get a sense of sort of what role have different communities played in, in developing and proposing and maybe even passing some of that legislation, either directly or indirectly. I'll let the assembly member go first. Well, th thank you for the question. Um, I, I think that since being elected to, to office, um, I'm starting my eighth year now as an assembly member, and it's one of the issues that has been so important for me in my during my tenure. Um, I, I introduced an, a number of pieces of legislation. Um, in 2018, it was AB 2447. Um, it, in AB 1547 and 21, AB 2840 and 22, and as you mentioned, AB 1000 um, uh, last year. Uh, and my colleague um, also introduced uh, legislation, AB 1748, um, uh, the, last year as well. I, I think that it's clear that it's an issue that has to be addressed. Um, when I listen to my colleague and friend, uh, um, uh, Paul Granillo, talk about this, it's 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 important to recognize that the goods movement is something that is important to the Inland Empire. And I don't think that anybody, whether we, we are, are for or against warehouses, I think everybody would agree that the Inland Empire um, has become the logistics hub. Um, and it's something that has provided a number of jobs. But I think that what is extremely important, especially for me and for the community that reaches out to me, is the impact on the community. And I think that uh, unless we're willing to find a balance between the two, we're going to continue with this problem. But, you know, maybe that's what some people would, would like, is for us to keep talking about it. I, I think that, um, as our panelist Mike was talking about, that we keep talking about it and nothing gets done. Something has to something has to happen. Um, in our AB 1000, we were able to take information that came directly from the Attorney General's guidelines on the siting of logistics 
that are 100,000 square feet or larger when it comes to siting them close to a sensitive receptor. And we also referred to a study done by CARB many years ago that said that if you build a warehouse too close to a home or to a school, to a child care center, and, it, and the measure in both of those guidelines was a thousand feet, that when you get closer to it than a thousand feet, it begins to affect the community that is next to these warehouses. It's not the warehouse itself, it's the traffic coming in and out. It's the diesel particulate matter that comes into the air <clears throat> that our residents and our, our children are, are breathing in. That's what the issue is. And it's the roads that the trucks go, go through. Um, and I go back to what I mentioned before, that we have to be able to sit and talk about these issues. I will tell you that, that I was very proud um, of, of the fact that we were able to put together a round table and both uh, Mike and um, Paul were part of this round table talking about the issue. Um, uh, former Mayor uh, Ron Loveridge, Professor R Loveridge was the moderator. And that was, it was extremely important to be able to have the conversations uh, about what is good legislation? How do you come up with the language? And for us, it was the Attorney General's guidelines. It was CARB's um, study that was done. It's a little outdated and they've talked about it since then, but there isn't a new study. Uh, there is nothing to show that, that, uh, that, that there is no harm. We know that there is harm. And we know that the American Lung Association just came out with their report showing that the Inland Empire, San Bernardino and Riverside County has the worst ozone level. We have the worst air. And if we don't take these things into account, um, we're setting our future generations up for for bad health. And I don't think any of us want this. Uh, uh, so um, the, the advocates that come into Sacramento, our partners that come up to Sacramento, um, that participate in trying to come up with a language, their opinions and their input is extremely important. I, I will tell you that I have convened a number of groups um, whether it's small business owners, um, whether it's those who build the warehouses, those who, who work in the warehouses, um, those who are concerned about the environment. In separate groups, in separate conversations, I have had conversations so that when we put together the language of legislation, tries to take into consideration all of these, these aspects. But as you can imagine, it's, it's never perfect. I wish it was, but it isn't perfect. Um, and I, I now something, and we'll talk about it later, is the fact that the Speaker of the Assembly has, has agreed that the issue is one that has to be addressed. But he, what he wants, is, what he is um, going to do is set up a working, working group so that it is all those who are impacted, all those who are somehow involved, who are stakeholders, bringing them together to talk to one another, not to speak over each other and to say, here's the line, it's drawn and we're not gonna move from here, but to say, okay, don't take everything away that we want and uh, expect us to give, every, give you everything that we're trying to do uh, on either side, but to say, okay, you have a valid point. Let's figure out how we take care of the health of the community and let's figure out how we can continue as a logistics leader um, worldwide so that in the end, it's something good economically, something good for the jobs, something good for, for the tax base, but it's also not damaging and harmful to, to our community. Um, the goods movement in general is something that uh, we're a big part of this. It's the ports and it's the warehouses and the ports have their issues and they're dealing with their issues. We here with the warehouses and the logistics centers, we have to deal with our issues. And I think that since the entire world is benefiting from what we do here, the entire world also has to be willing to pay for what we need to do to protect our community. There are different strategies. 
for accomplishing this. I don't think any one way is the perfect way, but I think we really need to talk to one another to find how we can balance, as I've talked about since the very beginning. Thank you. Paul, would you like to go next? Sure. Sure. So because this is put on by the School of Public Policy, right? I want to have a shout out for both Mike and um, the assembly member, right? We need to remember that we need to vote, right? We need to vote. We, our city councils, they're important. They make big decisions. They're empowered to make the planning decisions for our, 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 our city communities, as are the boards of supervisors. And then um, I, I would hope that uh, people who run for office have the heart uh, and the and the mind of an Eloise Reyes, right? Who really comes at this as a, a public servant and wanting to make sure she's doing the best for her constituents. And and that's never going to be easy. So just that's a shout out for public policy and everybody get out there and, and vote. I think that. Um, you know, the issues that the assembly member raises are spot on, okay? So um, my organization was a co-sponsor of AB 1748. Uh, the difference is, what are we talking about? A thousand foot setback, a 300 foot setback. Um, as the assembly member says, the science of the, the CARB study is, is dated, right? And so California has some of the cleanest trucks um, in the United States. Um, and that changes the equation, right? And so we need um, research uh, that's up to date that tells us what is factual, right? Um, and to make sure that we're protecting um, our residents. Um, and so this issue of making sure that for the burden that we carry, that in, there's equal investment, okay? And as we're talking about a good neighbor policy, and I alluded to it in my opening remarks, my friends, the, the drone delivery in your backyard is coming, okay? And can you imagine the people that aren't gonna like drones flying over, your neighbor's not gonna like a drone flying over their house to deliver something to you. That's gonna be a policy issue. The next generation of delivery trucks that pull up in front, of your house aren't gonna have just one person jumping out to deliver a box. It's gonna have um, 20 robots going out throughout the, the, the neighborhood, dropping off your deliveries, your medicine, um, your whatever you've ordered. Um, and that's gonna create an issue just on sidewalks and who gets to use the sidewalks, right? So this is more policy, right? This is, and, and in a lot of ways that's good because that is going to, require the upskilling of the people that work in this industry, right? And get them better paying jobs. But we, we're we gonna have to continue to, 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 to deal with this. And that's why I appreciate Roosevelt's presentation, right? About we need places to come together and, and debate um, respectfully. We need to come together and um, have a place where we can research um, because this is going to be a, a new part of our reality. Um, and for some of us that can remember what it was like before we had a, a cell phone, right? Um, that's, it's amazing what that phone can do and what we can learn from it, right? Can you imagine what the next 20 years is going to mean um, when we're talking about um, um, artificial intelligence and be able to think faster and we're gonna talk about robotics and, and then we're gonna talk about virtual reality and augmented reality. So all of these things have policy implications. We need to be using um, what we have been given um, and make sure that we're at the cutting edge of sustainability. And we wanna make sure that we don't lose our, 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 the, the benefit of uh, employment that this industry gives us. And we need to make sure that um, people that the federal government, the state government is investing in us, right? Because Eloise is correct, right? Um, we carry a huge burden and we need um, investment. Um, so for research and development and implementation and for community support of our communities, that is equal to the burden we carry. Thank you, Paul. Mike, should we keep to the same order? Sure. Um, 
So I guess going back to the original question, I, I want to just um, give a shout out to CCAEJ and uh, Sierra Club and um, uh, the Sycamore Hills Community Action Group, who are some of the people who filed the lawsuits that got the good neighbor guideline policies that are present in the city of Riverside, uh, the attorney general's office for having the one in the city of Fontana, and then the one in Moreno Valley that was filed by the Sierra Club over the World Logistics Center. So those are the things that cause the good neighbor. Po the policies that we have are because of those lawsuits, because there was such an egregious project that made enough people angry. So they showed up and then they ended up not being listened to. And then they sued and then they either settled or, or what have you. And then in response, the city then put in place the legislation. And unfortunately, that has been, as far as I'm aware, like the cause of all of the good neighbor guideline policies that we have. And we really, you know, there's only a handful of Inland Empire cities that do have good neighbor guidelines. Many of them have none still. Um, almost none of the San Bernardino cities do. Um, uh, San Bernardino County cities do. And so it's it's really, you know, we have a race to the bottom. And since we're sharing slides, I, I would like to share some slides too, if that's okay. That's Cause... absolutely. All right. So let me let me share this here. And I think I can do this. Okay. All right. That is, does that work? Okay. All right. Let's do this. Okay. Here's all the warehouses we have and all the warehouses we're going to have in the Inland Valley. This doesn't include the high desert, which I just can't fit on the map. So everything in red is an existing warehouse. Everything in black is a planned warehouse or warehouse complex. So like this is the World Logistics Center. This is going to be 40 million square feet of warehouses just here alone. There's a whole bunch of others. Okay. So I've tried to track every single warehouse that's in Sequinet that's proposed or planned in the region. And I'll get to why that's important from a planning perspective. And then this is where the average warehouse has been located over time. So back in the 80s, it was closer to LA. And then as time has gone out, it's sprawled farther and farther east. The average warehouse being built is now past the city of Riverside, basically. And it's bigger than it used to be, is the other key point about that. So there's this logistic sprawl. The trucks are ha having to take longer trips to get to where they're going. And that's an issue for our environment. There's also an issue of equity. The coastal counties built their warehouses back in the 80s and they were small warehouses. And since then, they've really had a big drop off in the amount of warehouses they've been building. If you look at Riverside County, we're gonna double our footprint this decade in terms of what's going on. A huge amount of warehouses. And almost all the warehouses in the last two decades, 95 plus percent have been built in Riverside or in San Bernardino County in the Southern California region. We've been growing at about 46 million square feet a year. Standard 2% growth rate. Some years we had good years and during recessions, they stopped being built. And if you take that amount of warehouses that we have built, oh, sorry, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna skip that slide and project out how long it's gonna take to build them. We have a 17 year backlog at the average rate and a 10 year backlog of warehouse projects if we build at the max rate that we've built over the last uh, 20 years. So that's, we have 400 million square feet of warehouses ready to be built on the books in the environmental planning phase. That's plenty of warehouses to keep us busy for a very long time. So the question is, how are we gonna accommodate them? Where are we gonna put them? And then the question becomes, do we have to put them all here next to our homes or to even replace our homes, which is the issue that I see. And so, um, you know, when we talk about how can community influence this, it's a question, it's, it's already here. We already have the most warehouses in the entire country. We're the Detroit of warehouses. And you know what happened to Detroit because they overinvested in auto manufacturing? They had a, they've had a 50 year doom loop once up manufacturing went away. If the port stopped being a big, you know, if, if Trans-Pacific trade stops happening, if, if, if there's geopolitical issues with China or with Asia in general, or if there's just something that causes the ports to not start, stop, we are extremely vulnerable to our over-concentration in warehousing, right? This is, this is something that is not just a boon, it is an over-concentration. And so the question is, where's the resilience? When we talk about sustainability, where's the diversification? You know, and we, we need to talk about those issues from a community perspective and from a, maybe I want a job other than a warehouse job perspective, because I, I am a business owner. I, I have my own business and I'd, I'd like to be able to, you know, expand my business here, but it seems like there's no place for me in the Inland Empire. 
the inland buyers is solely focused on the goods movement industry. Uh, and that is the type of buildings and the type of industry that we are focused on supporting. And so we can't just be solely focused. We can't put all of our eggs in one basket. And that's where I'd really like to have a broader conversation about how many warehouses do we need? Do they all need to be here? Can we put some of them in Orange County and LA County? Can they do their share? Like, wh why do we have to bear the brunt of this this regional burden, this glo this national burden, because these are these are goods that are flowing through us, not to us. Most of these goods go off to Chicago or Dallas or somewhere else. They don't they don't stay here. So just because these are goods and it's an important national industry does not mean it all has to be the burden of of our inland empire. Just because our land is a little bit cheaper. Thank you, Mike. So maybe I, I'll say a, a, a few comments. Um, from my perspective, I visited a warehouse uh, in the last few months, and I was, uh, I'm, of course, I'm impressed on how much technology is being used. It's robotics, it's automation, it's, uh, it, uh, you know, AI, it's advanced, uh, it's machine learning. And also what I thought there was um, an opportunity, let's say, is why are all of these technology not being developed here? Right, so we are importing technology. It's the, they are already here. The warehouses are here. There's a lot of automation being used. It's probably more as, as it, for sure that as Paul is, is mentioned, and it's not being developed here, right? And these are technologies that can be used in the logistics sector, but it can be used in agriculture, in advanced manufacturing, in the biotech sector, in the medical sector, because they are horizontals. So why don't we? and look at this at this industry and what in what is being used and then start thinking about how can I build or diversify the economy leveraging that industry and investing in in upskilling and also in in, in new businesses and and uh, and when we're talking also about the transition uh, for to next zero or the or, or, or the electrification when we talk to the companies that and we talk about the ports we talk to we talk to the Nonprofit organizations with the community, with other um, educational institutions, what they said to us is that sometimes they are hesitant to make large investments in technology, new technology around air, uh, improved air quality, around um, um, uh, electric trucks, for example, because there's a lot of uncertainty and they don't know exactly which technology should they be used. There's a lot of costs associated with that. So a place where we can have these dialogues, and not only in terms of you know where is there are the difference, but also the what what are the opportunities and how as a as a community as as, as all the stakeholders can actually work together to transition. I think that will be very uh, useful. They don't know. They told us they don't know what skills they need to have in the workforce because if we're going to do hydrogen or battery or something else, how are we going to train? They, they, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered as well. Even if we are, as if we're going through this trend, uh, uh, so uh, to me, it's a, an opportunity. I appreciate that. No, that's that's fantastic. Um, in the interest of time, we are going to try to keep the next next answers, if you can, to roughly two minutes. Um, for those of you who are on the call, that doesn't mean you. If you're trying to get everyone's answer, you're going to stay on a little bit after five. Um, but but I do think this is a really critical one given the the topic of this talk. So. Um, the, the question, the final question will be, uh, what strategies do you recommend to meaningfully involve communities and workers in the decision-making process related to future growth of the inland region? And specifically maybe is, is what needs to be done that isn't currently being done? And it's a lot to answer in two minutes, so I apologize. Do you want the same order again? Your preference, if you'd like. Justine, first, I, I do want to begin by, by thanking the School of Public Policy and the Inland Center for Sustainable Development. Uh, this is a really important conversation, and I really appreciate that you have included us in this discussion. I think that any when we're talking about this issue, uh, I, I, a favorite quote of mine is, nothing about us without us. If we're going to talk about a sustainable plan, a regional plan, we have to include the people who are most impacted by the development of these warehouses. 
If they're not included in the conversation, then we're talking about them without including them. I really appreciate the slides that Mike shared. I've seen them and every time I see them, Mike, I realize how big this issue is. Uh, we have over a billion square feet of warehouses, 4,000 warehouses with over, over a billion square feet already here in the Inland Empire. As you mentioned, over 400 million already in the queue. They've already been approved and they're going to be built. There isn't much more room for, for this. And if we're going to continue to, to build out the warehouses and the logistics, we have to do it in a sustainable way. I, I uh, appreciate Dr. Ochoa's comments regarding um, the automation. And it's something that can be good, but then we also have to look at the flip side of that because when, when the warehouses are being built, there's promises of all these jobs. But if it's all automated, then we're losing all those jobs. Every time we talk about automation, we're talking about taking out more of the jobs that were promised when we put these big boxes in, right next to the schools, right next to the, to the homes. It, 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 we, we have to include the community. We have to include those who are most impacted. We have to include the small businesses. At our round table, we were told by our small business representatives, he said, you're not talking to the small businesses. We're being, we're being taken out of the equation because we can't afford these big warehouses. We are small businesses. And every time you approve another large warehouse, it's something that it's property that we will never be able to, to be part of. These are Im important, impactful decisions that are made and, and we have to include all of the stakeholders. And I appreciate Paul's comments that the stakeholders include so many more. And I absolutely agree. Uh, we have to include those, who, the developers. We have to include the, the, those who are building the warehouses. We have to include those who are working in the warehouses. But we absolutely need to include those who are impacted by the warehouses. Um, and I've talked about the round table that I put together. I'm very proud of the fact that we did include all of these stakeholders. Something else that's important is the data. We have to collect the data. And that's why your center is so important because we have to collect the data about what's already been built out, the impact on our community. And we have to talk about those that have already been approved and what that is going to do to our community. There are some who say it's going to devastate our community and the quality of the air in our community. If the American Lung Association already has us as the, the worst ground level ozone pollution in the country, in the country, and in the top 10 in year round particulate pollution, we have to pay attention to this. This is the kind of data that I think has to be collected. The other thing that I think is extremely important is that we have to have a regional approach or a state approach. And Mike, you're right. If these are already approved, why do they all have to be in the Inland Empire? And why are they being built further and further away from the ports? If we're looking at vehicle miles traveled, we have to look at how far it is for these trucks to travel from the, from the ports to the warehouses. And the further we go from the ports, the more vehicle miles traveled, and that's got to concern us. There are lots of things, but again, uh, I really want to thank you, uh, Justine, for inviting me to be part of this. This is really a, a really important conversation. And the data collection is going to be so important for anybody who is trying to come up with a, a proper solution to this. And I also want to give a shout out to the Speaker of the Assembly who recognizes how important the issue is and is has asked Assembly Member Ramos, myself, and other stakeholders to be part of a working group to come up with a solution that doesn't exclude anybody and includes us all. Thank you. Thank you. And, and all thanks to ITSD. This is, I agree, a fantastic event. Paul. Sure, just uh, wanna thank everybody uh, at the School of Public Policy, UCR for putting this on and everybody who's uh, been attending. Um, just some, some top points, right? Um, if you look at uh, Google Maps at night, a um, lot of light over Southern California. So we just need to realize that we're one of the largest concentrations of humanity on the planet. Um, and the majority of us drive uh, combustion cars, right? So the issue of pollution has been something that has, uh, 
uh, been a reality for the basin um, since uh, we started driving cars, right? Um, and so we need to, to look at, uh, you know, getting to um, a, an electric future and a, a, a sustainable future as quick as we can. Um, to Mike's point, I totally agree, Mike. I think Santa Monica needs to have its share of warehouses. But I'll also tell you that uh, we've seen legislation from usually coastal uh, electeds uh, that want to take the tax revenue, the sales tax revenue uh, from the Inland Empire uh, because, well, I bought the thing in Santa Monica. Therefore, I'm, you know, Santa Monica wants their cut, right? So again, um, you know, let's talk to our, our, our coastal elite friends and uh, let them be a part of the solution as well. Uh, another good point about the ports, right? Uh, right now, we're about to see a big swing uh, because of climate change. Uh, there's a drought um, and that's affecting the Panama Canal, which is all hydro. Um, if you haven't had a chance, go through it. I did on my honeymoon and it was a great trip, right? But the, they are throttling um, at the port of, uh, at, uh, at the Panama Canal, and uh, the Suez um, has an issue because of the instability in the Middle East. Um, and so we're about to see port flows come back um, to, uh, to LA and Long Beach. Uh, just finally, the issue of data is absolutely key, right? Um, we need to tell our story, uh, whether, whether we're on the same side or not, I think, we need that data uh, because otherwise we're just talking at each other. We're not, we don't have the thing that can bind us together, which is what uh, Eloise did so well in her round table was to bring all the participants and, 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 and uh, under Dr. Leverage's uh, guidance, um, have a real dialogue. And we just need to continue to do that. Um, we don't need to let other people fix this for us. We need to fix it ourselves. Thank you. like to echo everyone else's comments. Uh, I'm honored to be a part of this esteemed uh, uh, panel. I mean, honestly, Assemblymember Reyes is a hero and Paul Granillo, you're a legend. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, uh, Rosabella Ochoa, I, uh, I, you're vice chancellor. So you got, you got, you got, you guys are very important people and I'm, I'm humbled to be here. Um, you know, there's a really well-established planning process in California, the general plan, the regional plans. We have great documents saying what our visions should be, but we don't have the community voice really directing or reflected 100% in that process. And so I really, the, the one thing that I'd really ask for is for um, the general plans and the regional plans to be inclusive of community with local community advisory boards or regional community advisory boards that include stakeholders that are traditionally marginalized in the decision-making process that don't have the same amount of voice. And it needs to happen early in the process before the plans and the policies are decided. Um, you know, that's really the key thing. And then, you know, uh, you know, I'm going after some grants with EPA to actually develop community-led regional planning visions for the region uh, that we're going to marginalize the developers and the and the goods movement industry. Sorry. So that you guys already have plans that reflect your vision. We would like some that reflect other visions. So uh, just as a counter narrative uh, to say, what does the region look like if we don't grow another 800 million square feet? Um, Lastly, I you know this is a this is my pet policy that I want implemented. We have a, a ballot proposition process where we can put anything on the ballot to re rebut anything. But in order to get something on the ballot, it like requires twenty percent of the votes of the last election, which is just impossible for a ballot initiative process. I think that should be triggered for like general plan amendment projects and for. Uh, um, projects that are large industrial projects that the community or environmental groups have have asked for like you know the challenge or whatever there should be some there should be some way to allow the community to directly override city and local land use officials with a community veto if 66% of the community members affected by a project vote against it and that would really give the hands and the power to the people um, which really is something that we don't have any policy way to do. So those would be the three things. And um, thank you all for letting me be here.
Thank you, Mike. So uh, finally, uh, real quick, uh, first, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I think from my perspective, what we didn't talk about today is the people, the, 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 the jobs and the, the employees and the people that are working in those warehouses and how are we going to, how are they going to upskill, how they're going to transition and adapt to the technology of the future. And so maybe in a, in a another opportunity, then we can uh, have that conversation in terms of how we're going to um, help our the workers, right, the laborers, create new businesses that are innovative, diversify the economy, and also provide opportunities for upskilling or transition or adapting to this, to this, to what is already here today, new technology, new tools that are already here. And we are, in my opinion, sometimes slow to, to react to them. And we don't want to be last. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you to all of the attendees who have stuck it out with us um, seven minutes past the hour and, and obviously to our panelists too. We appreciate that you all keep very busy schedules and are just thrilled that you were able to make time for us and to come together. Um, really quickly before we close out, I do want to remind everybody that our final event um, is going to be in a month on March 6th. The link to register is in the chat. I will drop it again or you can visit ICSD's website. And then finally, again, if you asked a question that we weren't able to get to or that wasn't otherwise answered, um, please keep an eye out over the next few weeks. We're going to be passing your questions along to the panelists. They'll have a chance to reply and, and we'll get answers back to you. So thank you all again so much for coming and for your interest and commitment to a sustainable future for our region. We look forward to seeing you at future ICSD and School of Public Policy events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye.